resolution in light microscopy. How fluorescence microscopy can now provide images on the nanoscale. Stefan Hell, Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry, Göttingen. On the 9th of November 89, I was in Heidelberg as a PhD student in physics. Having experienced communism in my childhood, I was very excited at seeing the wall come down. Ladies and gentlemen, as Ada, our previous speaker, put it very nicely, seeing is believing. I think this not only applies um, to our daily lives, it definitely also applies to the sciences, because I don't think it's a coincidence uh, in history of the natural sciences that the beginning of the natural sciences as we know them today very much coincides in time with the invention of the light microscope. Because with the light microscope, we were able to see for the first time that every living being consists of cells as basic units of structure and function, and of course, many organelles were discovered with the light microscope. However, we learned at school that the resolution, the ability of a microscope to see small things of a, is very much uh, limited by the wavelengths of light. So this diffraction barrier, as it's called, was a wall, a wall that seemed to stand forever in the 20th century, and it meant that if you want to see smaller things, you had to resort to electron microscopy. And there's no doubt about the fact that with electron microscopy, we could see much smaller things, in fact, down to the size or to the level of an atom. So the question comes up, why bother about the light microscope now that we have the electron microscope? Now, the answer is given actually in the next slide, where I made a little experiment. I've counted in this uh, journal, which is a basic medicine journal, the number of studies that were carried out with a light microscope and those that were carried out with an electron microscope. And I'll see which one won. It was in favor of the light microscope. As a matter of fact, light microscopy is still the most popular microscopy modality in the life sciences. And this has very good reasons. But the first reason is that it's the only way by which you can look into living cells. So this is very, very important. But there's another reason. There are many molecules in a cell, many proteins, for example, and we want to see them specifically. We want to know that particular protein, where it is located, and when it does what, and how it interacts with another protein. And in light microscopy, that can be done very easily because we can make these proteins look very specifically by attaching a chemical molecule, a molecule to them, that has a very fundamental property. It fluoresces. So if you shine light on it, the molecule is raised from a basic energy ground state to a higher lying state, and there it, it stands, it wiggles a bit, and then it comes down by emitting fluorescent light. It has a lower energy, a different color, and then you know exactly where this protein is located simply because of the color of light that comes out. And this is, of course, very sensitive. In fact, you can detect even single molecules. However, if two or three molecules come closer together than a distance of about 200 nanometers, the wall would apply, and you couldn't tell them apart. So the question is now, how can we break this wall? It's very obvious that if you manage to break it, then this would mean a lot to the life sciences. Now, in order to explain this to you, of course, I'm coming back to the basic case. Now, the most important element of a microscope is the objective lens, and the lens has a single role, to focus the light down to a point. However, because light propagates as a wave, it's not possible for the lens to concentrate the light on a single point. Rather, the light will be smeared out here, forming a blob that is at least about 200 nanometers wide and about 500 nanometers along the optic axis. And there are major consequences of that. So if you're having several features, molecule, whatever that is, falling within that range, they will be illuminated at the same time, they will fresh at the same time, it will not be possible for the eye or a camera to tell the signal apart. So, the man who actually realized this problem first was this man, Ernst Abbe, who coined this diffraction barrier in an equation that is named after him. He's basically saying, in order to be separate, two features of the same kind had to be further away than the wavelengths divided by this number, which is typically uh, something like two or three. Now, this equation can be found basically in any textbooks of optics or physics, but it can also be found uh, on this memorial, which was erected in his honor in Jena, where he lived and worked, and there it is written in stone. <laughs> and this is what we want to beat now. Now let's get back to the problem. As I mentioned, the problem is that all the features here are flooded simultaneously with light and hence give off light at the same time. Now if this is the problem and we can't do anything about that, maybe there is still a solution to the problem. Who says that we can't change the fact that the molecules that are flooded with light 
are in the end capable of sending light back. Because if we manage to keep some of them dark, as I'm indicating in here, we should be able to separate the bright ones from the dark ones. We only have to find a solution to keep these molecules dark. But wait a moment. I mentioned already the molecule has two states, a dark ground state and a basic excited state. And of course, this one is dark and this one is bright. The only thing we have to do is we have to make sure that the molecules here are not capable of assuming this excited state. Now, if you're trained as a physicist, of course, and you know that you have to play with states and have to keep the molecule dark, then you know there are phenomena by which you can make the molecule dark, and it's actually shown it here. You see, the concept of stat microscopy, which was the first concept that worked according to this way, uh, here you see the lens, you have the light for getting the molecule from the dark to the bright state. Of course, the lens will focus the light to a blob of light that is limited by diffraction, so governed by Aris equation. But what we want to do now is we want to shut off some of the molecules here so that we don't get a signal that is just the sum of all the signals from all the molecules here in the detector. Now, if you're trained as a physicist, then you know not only you can get the molecule from a dark to a bright state, but also de-excite it actually from the bright state to the ground state, simulated emission. It was mentioned already earlier. And so if you use a proper beam of light that shuts the molecules off, then we should be able to play this on-off game. And of course, this happens. If a beam is bright enough, beyond a certain intensity, you can basically turn it off because there's always a red photon there, so to speak, at a molecule that kicks the molecule down to the ground state, keeping it off. And of course, we don't want to keep off every molecule here. We would like to be selective in space, and this is why we change this beam such that we turn off the molecules in here. And of course, we would like to turn off even more molecules, for example, to see just the signal from here. And what do we have to do? We have to make the beam bright enough such that there's always a photon present uh, here it is at its inner part, and the molecules are being turned off, and so we see the signal only from here, and this way, of course, we can play the game. Why? Just by scanning these beams across the specimen, you see that adjacent features are forced to signal sequentially in time. And now, in this concept, the wall is broken. We can separate things that were not separable before. And the question was, of course, whether it works. And here it is, of course it worked. Um, and this is a, a difference in resolution that it is becoming actually quite apparent. And the applications are, of course, in the life sciences. This is an example of protein complexes that are not really visible here uh, because of the diffraction barrier. But now, if you apply this on-off game method, we can see uh, this protein complex in much greater detail. So I'm just zooming in, and as a result of the higher resolution, one can see this eightfold symmetry in here. I love to compare it with the standard resolution, um, and, uh, well, uh, it's a clear difference that you have in here. You can learn something new. HIV, this is one of the um, uh, applications. So for um, HIV, it's important to understand where a certain protein is located. It's called ENV. This detail doesn't matter. But what matters here is that the resolution is so high that we could find out where it is. And this is an um, um, indication of a very important step of maturation in HIV. So virology clearly is a large area of application because viruses are 30 to about 150 nanometers in size, so just below the diffraction barrier. Living cells. Um, this is living cell imaging at the extreme. So this is the brain of a living mouse, a stretch of a dendrite, and we can see now these postsynaptic signs, the so-called dendritic spines, as a result of the higher resolution. You can see them even move slightly, meaning that if you learn something, not only chemical things happen, but also there's something going on um, uh, that moves, something that is morphologically changing. It's interesting to, to see that in, in detail. Now, dynamics, of course. Uh, with light microscopy, you can see dynamics, which is not really possible with electron microscopy. And it's not only the life sciences, material sciences. So here, we see the formation of a colloidal crystal at high resolution. If the resolution is turned off here, you see nothing. And um, this is exactly what sh it shows what high-resolution imaging is all about. Now, initially, of course, it looked like this, so you have to go through many details, experiments by now. It's commercially available, and now that it's commercially available, the question comes up at the end, what happens now with Abbe's equation? We've seen it written in stone. Well, okay, let's do a little experiment. I've done it, in fact. So this is a sample where we measure the spatial resolution, and now we increase the resolution further and further. You see it becomes clearer and clearer. The resolution now 22 nanometers, and I'm jumping now over the barrier like this. A lot of fun to do it, and if you take now these numbers, of course, and plot it 
over the intensity that we apply, we see that it scales here inversely with the ratio of the intensity over characteristic of the, of the material. And now we know what we have to do in order to yeah, adapt the microscope to the 21st century. Well, we just put in the square root factor. And this now explains the fact that we can definitely image at higher spatial resolution and that we can separate, for example, features here and here, but here we can't. And this equation has an important message in it. If you remember your yeah, uh, high school mathematics, this term, if it becomes large, then d goes down to zero, meaning that the wall is truly broken. So the limit here of resolutions is actually the size of the molecule. So there's no longer fundamental limit but the size of the molecule. Now, final thing I have, so that's my take-home message. Why can we separate this fiber from that fiber, but not here? Well, I think you know it by now. At the time, this fiber was on emitting, this one was off. And at the time, this one was on, the other one went off, was off. Sometimes physics is very simple, believe me. Thank you very much.